All right, I'm going to call the meeting to order. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, good evening, everybody. We're gonna do just a quick roll because we do have a board member on Zoom um, because we are missing one of our board members tonight, board member Muren. So I'll just have Cynthia say that you're here. Can you hear her, Cynthia? I can, uh, I can just, she maybe speaks a little louder into the microphone. Say, I just heard that say I present. Participating, just present, thank you. <laughs> board member Baker. Present. Board Member Ryder? Present. And Board uh, Vice President Parker? Present. Um, we will start with the approval of minutes of meetings held January 10th, 2022 and January 10th, 2022. So moved. Second. All right, we've got a motion and a second. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? All right, that motion passes. Uh, we do have a person wishing to address the school board on non-agenda items. I'm just gonna read this really quick. The board sets aside a portion of each meeting agenda to hear from community members on items of general interest or concern as well as regular agenda items. Comments are limited to five minutes unless more than three people signed up. Then the group is limited to 15 minutes total. And we'll let you know when you have one minute remaining so you can wrap up your comments. If there are multiple people attending to speak on one topic, we would encourage you to coordinate your comments. When you're called to the podium, please identify yourself and your address and the organization you represent for the record of the meeting. If you have any visual aids or handouts, please see a member of our communications team prior to the meeting. They will help you distribute information and approve any item to be shown for public viewing. The board does not take comments during this time on any personnel matters and then all meeting attendees are expected to treat others with respect and civility. The board will not respond to individual comments and staff may be requested to follow up as needed following the meeting. Thank you and um, thank you for coming and tonight we will welcome Chad Bishop as our speaker tonight. If it doesn't work, that's fine. We'll, we'll survive. Oh, there we go. Good evening, my name is Chad Bishop. I live at 7405 South Valencia Drive here in Sioux Falls and I represent myself. First, a correction, I got Rupard. If you're unfamiliar with this term, it means a video was clipped in such a way as to remove context, enough so as to fundamentally change the meaning. For example, the Find People hoax is probably one of the most successful pieces of propaganda ever executed and it was a Rupar. In fact, it was so successful that our current president cites it as the core of his origin story for choosing to run again. And I quote, and in that moment, I knew the threat to this nation was unlike any I'd ever seen in my lifetime. That piece of propaganda convinced 50% of the country a sitting president called neo-Nazis and white supremacists fine people, and that anyone who supported him was overtly racist. Distract and divide, but I digress. In my case, Dr. Walensky of the CDC, when talking of 75% of people who succumb to COVID-19 having four or more comorbidities was speaking specifically about the vaccinated deaths. When advocating for removing processed food from school lunches, I had misunderstood this point. Per the CDC, the reality is for 6% of deaths, COVID-19 was the only cause mentioned. For deaths with conditions or causes in addition to COVID-19, on average, there were 2.9 additional conditions or causes per death. My apologies. As always, I continue to reserve the right to be wrong in public. 
In the spirit of diffusing an artificial political and social tension, I am once again asking for you to consider acknowledging staff and students with COVID-19 recovered status in your policies, to reimburse your employees and staff for SARS-CoV-2 antibody and adaptive T-cell response assays so that they may learn their immune status, and lastly, to work with the state legislature to procure funding from the $974.5 million currently in the Treasury for COVID-19 relief. Speaking of propaganda, what do we make of the leaking of Dr. Fauci's emails showing him seeking to smear and discredit Harvard's Martin Kulldorff, Oxford's Sunetra Gupta, and Stanford's Jay Bhattacharya as signatories of the Great Bar Barrington Declaration in opposition to the policy of blanket pandemic lockdowns, calling them, quote, fringe epidemiologists. Again, Harvard, Oxford, Stanford, fringe for proposing risk analysis and focus protection, a policy for which CDC's Dr. Olenski has recently expressed support. I didn't get Rupert on that one. Time has proven them more correct than not by far. What should we make of the report by Reuters citing the CDC's January 19th MMWR report, which states, importantly, infection-derived protection was greater after the highly transmissible Delta variant became predominant, coinciding with early declining and vaccine-induced immunity in many persons. Now, even I feel a bit dishonest talking about this report in this way because I understand these statements are in terms of relative risk reduction as opposed to absolute risk reduction. If a person starts out with a risk here, if they're vaccinated, the risk becomes here. If a person starts out with a risk here and they are, have recovered status, their risk becomes here. That is absolute risk reduction from here to here. The difference between the two is relative risk reduction, and this is the game that they play. The point is made in the Lancet article entitled COVID-19 Vaccine Efficacy and Effectiveness, the Elephant Not in the Room, where they attempt to explain why this is done in vaccine studies. Quote, ARRs tend to be ignored, absolute risk reduction, because they give a much less impressive effect size than RRRs. Do we have any evidence of this in our own state? Last Tuesday morning, the South Dakota House Health and Human Services Committee heard testimony from the Department of Health. In responding to questions, the state epidemiologist, Dr. Clayton, informed the legislators that the number of reinfection cases had risen to 4,000. Dr. Clayton also reported that 18 of those individuals sadly died after reinfection. The doctor did not speak to the demographics of either the reinfected or the deceased. The Department of Health COVID-19 dashboard last Tuesday reported 174,029 recovered cases. That would mean the updated reinfection rate for South Dakota is approximately 2.3% over 22 months. Since the first case in our state, it would mean that our mortality rate among the reinfected approximately is 0.01% across all demographics in our state over that same period of time. 2.3% over 22 months, which includes the time where the vaccine-induced immunity is purported to be more efficacious. For comparison, the editor of the Rapid City Journal tweeted this table stating it was too important not to share. It contains a summary of cases, hospitalizations, and deaths for the not fully vaccinated, but conveniently omits the fully vaccinated. My nature being what it is and my distaste for propaganda by omission, I responded to the following, asking the Department of Health representative to confirm the two columns on the right. If I don't get an answer directly, multiple legislatures, legislators are following up. The 2.3% reinfection rates over 22 months compared to a 14.6% breakthrough case rate May 1st to the present. Thank you. Thank you. We don't have any persons uh, to address to the board on any agenda items, so we'll move on to the approval of the agenda. Can I get a motion and a second, please? So moved. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All, any opposed? Okay, that motion passes. And on to the good news report. All right, good evening. Tonight, I have the pleasure of delivering the good news report. Uh, in the fall of 2021, we set out to source information from our working community within the Sioux Falls School District. So through the Better Together, Together initiative, we have
Bill. The Better Together Their initiative was part of the district priorities for the 21-22 school year. And working forward, we look at staff excellent and excellence and really looking forward to encourage staff to submit their innovative ideas, those light bulb ideas. Um, we use the crowd um, loop, which is a platform that allows staff to put information in, they suggest their ideas and other people to comment on those ideas. And so throughout that process, through the month of October, um, we had, the question is, what is an idea that you feel would enrich either the student experience or the staff environment? So we collected 43, 43 different ideas um, through that crowd loop, and they had 28 staff work environment submissions and 15 student experiences. And through that, um, one submission rose to the top, and it was Alyssa Anderson from Edison Middle School. Alyssa, come on up here. And her idea was for an unconference. And that unconference, I'm gonna let her talk about that because she submitted that idea and then we'll tell you how we're gonna move that forward. So Alyssa is our winner and we were lucky enough to go out there and visit with her last Thursday at Edison. Um, first, I'd like to say thank you for choosing my idea. Um, what an unconference is, it's professional development for teachers by teachers. And so staff can present their ideas as well as sign up for professional development um, that they feel they need in order to prioritize that and also showcase that expertise of the staff that we have here in Sioux Falls. And you participated in a couple different events. Yes, I've that. been at a couple different unconferences right. and they've been wonderful, I really enjoy them. And sometimes they're called ed camps and and so you sign up for this conference, you go to the conference and you list different topics that you want to learn more about. And, and then those filter to the top and they assign rooms to whether it's assessment or I wanna learn about personalized learning or I wanna learn about gamification, different topics and then there's a facilitator in that room but everybody wants to learn about that topic goes to that into that classroom during that breakout session. And so we're able to do that through the Sioux Falls Inspire Education Conference the first week in August. We're gonna have a couple different times where we will do an unconference. And during that time, um, the people that register for those breakout sessions, they will go ahead and submit the things they wanna learn about. We'll filter those to the top and facilitate those different rooms. And so we're very excited to take your idea and move it forward um, for our staff in the Sioux Falls School District. So Alyssa, thank you for taking time to submit that idea, bring it forward to us, um, and then we're excited to be able to um, take that forward in August. So thank you. Very cool. Thanks, Alyssa. I think what a great idea because like you mentioned, um, there are so many experts in our own district and so many people who have passions about different things. And so what better way for them to be able to share that information and also feel recognized for the time and energy that they spent learning more and investing in themselves. So awesome, and then you have somebody that's here. If you have a question, a follow-up, it's not like you have to email somebody and they live in another state or, or whatever and they hopefully will get back to you, but you actually have somebody right here in Sioux Falls that you could reach out to. So great idea, it's awesome. I can't wait to hear how it goes. That's exciting and that was our first crowd loop experience and then um, we will move forward with that again next fall. Mm -hmm. So look forward to that. Yeah, you know, crowdsourcing is just a nice way for us to glean the best that our folks have to offer. And the intent is, you know, for that one bright, shiny idea to emerge as something that then becomes part of the fabric of our district. But the other byproduct of it is we got just a lot of good feedback on some things that were maybe a pet peeve or, you know, something that said, why is it this way instead of this way? And we could look at it and make a, a change very easily. So. Um, you know, there are ways to do that all the time, but this is something that intentionally asks for that feedback. And so we're looking forward to having this just be part of how we do things. And eventually we'll probably do it with um, students and our parents and kind of open them up with some intentional ways that they can submit ideas after we get the hang of using it. Great idea, thank you. We're excited about that and um, when we move forward, Alyssa has graciously agreed to help support us in that first event, so we're excited for that. Awesome. So, thank you. Thank you. 
All right, we did not have any conflicts of interest this week, so we'll move on to the approval of the consent agenda, items 9A through G. Can I get a motion and a second, please? So moved. Second. Now all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, aye. Same, same sign. All right, that motion passes. And moving on to the supplemental consent agenda, we're gonna do a roll call um, with these next two items. Can I get a motion and a second for claims to Sanford? So moved. Second. All right, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Oh, roll call, sorry. <laughs> President Mickelson? Aye. President, uh, Board Member Baker? Aye. Board Member Ryder? Stain. Board Member Parker? Aye. That motion passes. Now, can I get a motion and a second for claims to Avera? So moved. Second. All right. Uh, roll call vote. So, President Mickelson? Aye. Board Member Baker? Aye. Board Member Ryder? Aye. Board member R. Parker, abstain. That motion passes. All right, reports of the superintendent. And tonight we have Dr. Christy Fedden. I believe this is your inaugural report to the board. Um, Dr. Fedden joined us earlier this year as our um, director of special education services. And one of the to do items at the top of the list has been to move us over to a digital environment. And so she's going to cover that. Um, tonight as part of her report. And this is a really great step for us. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this opportunity to share information about SPED Advantage. And ironically, this really couldn't have come at a better time. And I'm gonna share a picture here in a minute um, as to why. So this, if you were to wander back to the north rooms of our building today, what you would find is boxes upon boxes of special education files. We are in day one of a five-day review with the State Department of Education, which happens every five years. And so this is a visual example of our current system of managing cumulative files and special education data for students. And this is just a small snippet of a countertop <laughs> of what it looks like back there. So I, again, it really comes at a good time. And special education and accountability, this is nothing new. We've had an accountability requirement for 25 years. I've been in special education for 28 years. And so we know that accountability is important. And with that comes those specific regulations that have to be made at, met at the state and local level. And that's really what this review that's happening this week is, is looking at exploring those regulations. We also know that with regulations comes the need for documentation. And it's, it's not the accountability piece that is concerned learning um, in driving the paperwork requirement. We're very, very um, uh, looking forward to accountability measures, and we know that accountability is very necessary in the work that we do. So it's not the culprit when we're talking about that burden of paperwork. And in fact, it enhances our teaching and learning, holds our special educators and our students with disabilities to those high expectations. And it also helps us to strengthen practices that improve outcomes for all students. But the paperwork within this accountability framework can quickly overwhelm our special educators. And I can speak, I spent um, um, the first two thirds of my career as a school psychologist, so did a lot of report writing and a lot of paperwork. So I understand how quickly this can um, build into the, um, a burden for our teachers. So what we want to do is find a way to reduce that burden, maintain those high expectations, keep that accountability feature, but let our teachers focus on what really matters most, and that is educating our kids with disabilities. That's our top priority. So why SPED Advantage? That's our, our tool and the mechanism that we are, are utilizing to get to that point of reduction. And so one of the things that we have done in our department over the past few years is we've gathered feedback and we've asked special educators, what can we do to help you do your jobs more efficiently, more effectively, to be able to focus on students and families? And you can see some of the responses here from our most recent survey, and a lot of them focused on the 
the paperwork and the paperwork burden and finding a way to streamline that. Um, we had a specific request um, for that investment in an up-to-date online IEP system. So that's come out loud and clear from our special educators that they were ready to move in that direction. And it's no surprise given the fact that we serve almost 4,000 students a year um, who have disabilities. And that doesn't include the number of students that are evaluated each year and maybe don't qualify for services. So we generate a lot of paperwork and a lot of documentation. So another important factor, and we'll, we'll look in a minute at how this links to our district priorities, but our human resources are our most critical asset in our special education department. And so we know that listening to the needs of our staff, finding ways to help them to be more efficient in their work is a really, really important component, um, in particular, as we know that special educators are dwindling in supply. So we are working as hard as we can to retain our, our quality special educators. And SPED Advantage is just one of the ways that we are going to make that happen. So we're gonna talk just really quickly about how SPED Advantage is aligned with district priorities. And you can see we're focusing on, on staff excellence, the effective use of resources, academic success, and well-being of our staff. So the first component that's really exciting, and we um, actually at our back to school kickoff, we had some um, shouts of joy. I will say it was an exciting moment when we unveiled that we were looking at this online IEP system. And again, the goal is to look at efficiency and to help maximize the time that teachers have and minimize that time that they're spending on paperwork. So in turn, what that does is again, it frees up our special educators to focus on what we know matters most, creating those opportunities for specialized instruction, helping our students to make meaningful progress. So those are the key pieces there with that well-being. This is another visual of what it looks like inside those boxes of files. So it's very exciting. I, the, one of our principals this afternoon, I was out at a building and he said that he realized he needed to lift more weights as he was trying to carry, carry the files over. So this is where our current reality is with our files. And this is an example of what SPED Advantage looks like. And if anyone wanted a more in-depth look in the system, I'm happy to do that. I didn't want to pull that up here um, because, of course, we're protecting confidentiality of our students that are in the system. Um, but we do have the capacity to pull up a test case if you ever had an interest. But you can see the system was designed by a special educator, and it is actually set up like a, one of our paper files. And it's very easy to use. It's very efficient and very streamlined in regard to being able to access uh, the information within the system. And I will say I've been using an online IEP system for about 10 years in my previous district, and this system, it surpasses what we were using in that district, so I'm really excited. Um, in regard to staff excellence and effective use of resources, our goal, of course, is to decrease the paperwork burden, maintain that high, that focus on, on high um, expectations and accountability, and offer that um, opportunity to increase instruction. So some of the key pieces with SPED Advantage is the critical dates that we need to keep track of are gonna be available on dashboards. Staff are going to be frequently reminded via email that there are deadlines coming up and there are due dates. So there's lots of features that are built into the system and the automaticity is really gonna be key for keeping our, our team um, in line and not having to keep those separate little notes in your calendar. So it'll be much more efficient. Another way that we're looking at that staff excellence and effective use of resource is looking at the, the data integrity and the accuracy of our system. There's timely access to reporting. Um, for in preparation for our state review, we struggled to really pull information. It was sitting in multiple different databases. SPED Advantage is gonna give us at our fingertips the quick and easy way to pull any report that we need for all of our required reporting, um, sharing information in regard to specific disabilities categories, all kinds of information is going to be really, really streamlined um, and easy to access in a timely manner. 
One of the features I'm really excited about because I'm a big proponent of effective progress monitoring and making sure we have data for families is that there are some tools that are built into the system that are gonna help our case managers really track progress of students. We'll have some data visualization that's built into that system as well, tied directly to those goals and objectives in the IEP. And if parents consent um, to receive information electronically, we'll be able to really quickly and easily and efficiently send information, uh, again, really at the touch of a button when families need that. So our responsiveness is going to increase as well. Some of the other features of SPED Advantage are, again, the, automatic, uh, the automaticity, customizable dashboard. We are one of the biggest clients of SPED Advantage right now, so they're very eager to support our work. Um, I have to give a shout out to our information technology team. They are phenomenal. Um, we have a, a specific individual, Peter, who is working with our team, and they speak a foreign language when they get together and talk about programming, but luckily he knows how to how to speak that programming language, and he has been fantastic. So um, it's a, been a really great example, too, of collaboration across departments and bringing these massive systems into alignment so that our teachers have that power. So implementation science drives the way that we roll out new initiatives in our work. So we moved fairly quickly through the exploration phase. SPED Advantage was a natural fit. They work directly with the South Dakota Department of Education and are really on top of any changes that are made. Um, they make those adjustments really quickly within the system itself. There's a built-in network with some other special ed directors. So there's some nice features that are really built in um, to help us move forward in that direction. We have already had multiple trainings and we have staff members on our team who came from other districts that were SPED Advantage users. So it's amazing to me, like we have teachers that have just run, running with the system and they're asking, okay, so now procedurally, what, what do you want us to do with our IEPs when they're done? And like, we're trying to catch up by writing our procedural manual. So we have some of our teachers that have just really run with it and it's been very exciting to see. We will be in that initial implementation phase fully online by, by August of 2022. We've given our teams that autonomy to be able to kind of move at their own pace this year um, because we realize that change, this is a big, big change and a big transition um, for our district. So the last piece I wanted to share is the cost. Um, SPED Advantage is driven by our December 1 count. So uh, they, they wanted to provide really that, um, a, a nice way to have that fixed amount that we would be charged each year. And it's really gonna function, fluctuate probably around that $50,000 mark per year. Um, so that's our anticipated cost. We had a one-time startup fee, um, and I think we've probably exceeded, they, they've been so gracious with their time, um, but we're looking at about, probably about a $50,000 fee. So that is the conclusion of my brief overview of SPED Advantage, if there's questions you have. Any questions? No, I, oh, I was just, I think it's, Fantastic. Um, you know, I think I still have a file um, from my son in speech therapy for several years, and it's probably about yay thick of all the IEP yes. reports that we would get. So I can just imagine what you, we have for all of our 4,000 students. Um, and uh, mm -hmm. um, so I know that this is probably a long time coming, and what a great way to just support our staff. And, and, you know, I'm thinking too of our families and how easy it is for them to be able to access those reports and um, almost like we do with our medical reports. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's exciting. Yes, thank you. And thank I think even like much. continuity of education when they move from grade to grade and teacher to teacher for them to be able to look back and really get a nice summary of what's been going on versus, you know, paging through files of paper and things like that. So I just think, yeah, like you've mentioned several times, the overall experience for the, the student and the family and especially the teacher should be a lot more pleasant than, than it has been. Um, and yeah, I think it's awesome that you um, have people who have experience with it too that can kind of be the leaders in some of those buildings and, and get people to, to get on board with them at whatever pace they choose. But um, yeah, I think once they see the difference that online makes, it will be an easy decision for people to make. Yes, absolutely. 
Well, okay. I appreciate your time. And I, I would ask for the board to acknowledge the board report for SPED Advantage. Can I get a motion and a second? So moved. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. All right, that motion passes. All right, the next report is coming from um, Mr. Veek. It's our FY22 second quarter finance report. Thank you. So in your uh, in your packet, you have the monthly business manager's report on our finances through December. This is just a quick update um, for everybody. Today, we talked about the uh, revenue last in September, last quarterly report we had. We said we're gonna be a little low on the general fund because we came in under projections on the fall enrollment, however, it'll be offset by, we're gonna be quite a bit higher on the, the capital outlay fund due to some E-rate dollars that we didn't expect when we budgeted last year. So that will offset that shortfall. On the expenditure side, and, and the revenues really haven't changed since then. The only the only stuff that's outstanding really on those revenues that, that makes a big deal is um, the bank franchise tax. However, if we come in over, we just reduce our state aid two years down the road. If we come in under, we get more state aid down the road. So that that in the big scheme of things, that isn't a big factor anymore, how we come in on those other revenues outside the formula. On the expenditure side, when you look at uh, the report you can on the, in the general fund, you can see uh, we look like we're ahead of pace last year. We're 41% spent through December versus 39.94 last year, which really is only about a percentage point more. But uh, in, in reality, mo most of that is on the federal side. We just haven't kept, we gotta do a supplemental budget on the federal side. When you pull the federal money out, which you don't have in your report, we're 39% spent versus 43% last year. So we're actually behind the pace and uh, that's what we'd expect because some of those items that uh, we were originally going to budget in the, in the, the unrestricted general fund got budgeted in semester dollars. So, and you'll see that reflected in next year's budget when we go through that. On the SPED side, we're uh, behind pace last year. So both of those are those are coming in really well. And it's still too early to tell we're way under 50%, even though we're halfway through the year. We'll know more as we get into the budgeting cycle, but everything looks like it's coming in positive um, in uh, both funds. So with that, I just ask you to acknowledge the finance report. Thanks. Thank you. Any questions? All right. Can I get a motion and a second to approve the FY22 second quarter finance report? So moved. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. That motion passes. And up for the 2022 legislative update. Yeah, I think we got about 16 bills or so that uh, the board has not reviewed. These are our this is our first one, uh, first time to do that this year. So we'll go through these, we, how we usually do it is, I'll just kind of whip through them. And uh, if you've got questions or wanna propose to maybe change the position, just stop me, okay? Um, we'll start in, these are online, and you've got these in your materials as well. So we'll start with uh, House Bill 10,000 or 1005. It, uh, provides for the use of public school multi-occupancy rooms and sleeping rooms. It would require that, uh, among other things, that uh, for overnight sleeping accommodations at any school-sponsored sanctioned event, you'd have to have, uh, you'd have to potentially allow kids to stay by themselves if they if they don't fit one of the groups. Um, we we uh, suggest no position on the bill. House Bill 10,006 
creates uh, three designated categories of athletics teams, boys, girls, and co-ed based on biologi biological sex at birth. We propose no position at that bill, on that bill. On House Bill 1012, it uh, outlines tenants that are pre prohibited regarding critical race theory. We propose no position on that bill. Next page, uh, House Bill 1015 has already died. It affected uh, property tax levies, but that's covered in another bill coming up, so the sponsor asked for it to be tabled. House Bill 1039 uh, lowers the valuation of mostly West River grasslands. It's grasslands above 1,950 feet of sea level. We, uh, we propose opposing the bill because when you lower valuations um, the rest of the the rest of the state has to pick it up in the two state aid formulas so you're kind of artificially raising everybody else's a little bit to lower these probably quite a bit so we just propose opposing that bill house bill 1040 um, slightly tweaks the maximum general fund levies in a school um, that's the one i described earlier 1015 that's the one that has died um, because of the other bill. Um, the 1015 bill, I'm sorry, was would require a moment of silence at the beginning of the day, and that bill was killed in committee to uh, right away. Um, House Bill 1064 would uh, base the FY23, it's kind of weird, FY23 state aid allocation on the FY21 fall enrollment if it is greater than the FY22 fall enrollment. Otherwise, it is based on the FY23 fall enrollment. I think that's a mistake. I think they meant if FY22 is higher than FY23, then the FY23 is based on FY22. However, I'm not sure, so we propose an amendment doing that. Otherwise, it really doesn't make sense. Um, House Bill 1075, essentially it's a, it says that uh, the newspaper when they print our minutes or all school, all public entities minutes, will add a line at the bottom that says this can be found at a state clearinghouse also. Um, and that we estimate that it'll cost us, cost us close to $1,000 and we pay around 50,000 a year, so it's about 2%. Um, additional costs just to say that these are available on the website. When they're available on our website, they've been for years and years and years. So we would propose an amendment that says that's all they print, is these are available on this website or our website. And uh, obviously that would be a, a, a big savings. Without that amendment, we oppose it, otherwise we'd be neutral. Because you can go to our website right now and see all our minutes going back for several years. House Bill 1077 changes the oath for all public officials to match the oath that legislators take. We propose no position on that bill. I guess it's to standardize the oath, I guess. Uh, House Bill 1080 extends from FY21 to FY24 that we will exceed, meet or exceed our average teacher compensation from FY17 that will run out otherwise in FY22. Our, um, no position, we're well, we're well above what we paid in teacher compensation, won't have any effect on us. So um, 1081, it treats solar energy tax revenue like wind energy tax revenue in uh, the other funds that they, they redistribute among schools now. Uh, it makes sense, we support that bill. The bill uh, 1087 amends a list of records not open to public inspection, essentially adding cybersecurity plans to that list and making that list exhaustive. We, have, we take no position on that bill. House Bill 1111 would uh, say that if 5% of the electorate of a school district refers any resolution that pertains to a matter of health or safety that places requirement or limitation on students or employees to a vote, once the uh, petition is certified, the resolution is put on hold. Uh, we oppose it. We think it's, 
it might be very extremely specific or very broad, we don't know which. You guys pass about 2,000 actions a year and uh, about a handful are resolutions. So we don't know if they mean resolutions or actions when, when they say that. If it's resolutions, it's very specific and won't have much of an effect. If it's uh, actions, then, then uh, pertains to a matter of health or safety, seems really broad to us. So, and then the fact that if 5% sign the petition, then it puts it on hold for up to a year while you wait for the uh, regular school board election to appear, depending on when you pass the, the action, seems like, um, well, it just seems, uh, so we, we oppose it. It's either, well, it's very specific or, or way broad, don't know which, and, and either way, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, House Bill 1119, allows schools to include in their state aid fall enrollment 10% of each homeschool student who participates in public school activities. So I suppose whether you're one or in one or five or six activities, you're worth a 0.1 FTE. Um, we're no position on that bill. Don't really know exactly where that number comes from and doesn't seem like it would have a great effect on that anyway. Um, on the Senate bills, 46 um, is a, it would create the one again, three designated, it's the same as 1006, no position. It, it creates three categories based on biological for sex at birth. Senate Bill 59 is the governor's proposal to increase state aid 6%. Um, the median increase in state aid because they redid the disability categories this year is 3.1%. We support the bill um, and we want it to be a key bill because we think that 6% is somewhere in line with inflation. Otherwise, we're looking at 2.6 if they just follow what's in the current index factor. Senate Bill 71 increases the partner's education tax credit by 75%. It's going up from 2 million to 3.5 seven, five million. We oppose the bill, you got limited tax revenue and you're diverting it into, into because you're essentially just lowering the taxes by the amount that gets donated to this program. So you're, you're diverting it to private schools and uh, they don't follow the same open enrollment rules that public schools do. So we oppose that bill. Senate Bill 72, um, would establish the crime of hazing and to provide a penalty. Therefore, we say no position on that bill. Hazing is addressed in current district policy. And I doubt that based on what we've seen, the courts will, will do much more than the district would as far as punishment goes. Um, Senate Bill 94, it would add the House and Senate committee chairs to the State Board of Education Standards as non-voting members. We say no position on that bill. Senate Bill 95 changes the review cycle of the teacher compensation review board from every two, every three years to every two years. And it changes their terms from three to two years to match that. We support that bill. I think looking at that more often than not, we'll keep hopefully on the front burner the fact that uh, what schools receive from the state and state aid is what they can afford to increase teacher salaries because salaries and benefits are over 80% of our general fund expenditures and they're over, and the state aid formula is over 80% of our general fund revenue. So that's it. I'll just stand by for questions or comments. Thanks. Any questions? Okay. Thank you, Todd. Can I get a motion and a second to approve the positions um, for our 2022 legislative update? So moved. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Post same sign. All right, move that forward. All right, and Carly, we've got um, two of our board members are on our policy review committee. And Carly, do you wanna? take the next item? Sure, so um, Board Member Murren and I are the two representatives on the Policy Review Committee. So we met um, last week and have um, several policies that um, Brett's gonna go through with us tonight. 
Uh, thank you. Yep. So we have uh, eight policies on the agenda tonight. Um, as board member Ryder said, we did meet as a policy review committee to address these. Um, we're recommending uh, minor revisions to three of these policies. And I'll just quickly go through those. Um, on policy CGD, um, we made some minor revisions related to federal programs. And this is to include some, re some uh, federal requirements um, in that language. These aren't new requirements, just a recitation of what those requirements are. Uh, policy DKC, um, with just some minor updates to uh, travel expense approval. Um, and then finally, in uh, policy JJID and its accompanying regulation, um, just some changes to clarify the timing of the pre-participation physical evaluations. Um, and then just kind of some cleanup in there so it's a little bit easier to follow through the policy and the regulation. Um, so those are the, the three uh, changes. And I'd ask for you to approve the review revise of these eight policies. So moved. Second. Any questions? All right, all those in favor. The resolution on the physical change? Sorry, no. <laughs> <laughs> Late related to our legislative update. Okay, all right. <laughs> legislative humor. <laughs> All right, well, any, um, uh, all those in favor of the review revision of the uh, eight policies? Signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. All right, that passes. I would just add um, regarding student physicals, I know that it's only January 24th, but if you are a student that plans on participating, anytime after April 1st, you can get your physical. So your physicians would probably appreciate if you scheduled that now so that you were not one of the last minute people and we would hate to have your student not be able to participate in something because they didn't have that done. So that's my plug yes. um, for spring, that. Spring sports are around the corner. Yes. Yep. So. All right. Okay. Any other uh, good of the order? Any other business to be discussed tonight? All right. Can I get a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Post same sign. All right. We are adjourned.